we have been in a series called Money Money Talks. We've been in a series. First of all, if it's your first time, can you give me a wave first time here? I am so glad that you're here, like for real, for real. On behalf of my wife, that fine woman that was up here earlier, that blonde woman is my wife, and uh, we're just so glad that your face is in the place today. We've been in a series called Money Talks, and this is the last sermon in the series. So you're like, I'm tired of you talking about money. Okay, this is the last one. But I truly believe God's been doing awesome things in this series. How many have been blessed by this series? That's been my prayer. My prayer in this series is not to raise more money in the church. My prayer in this series is that you would understand a heart of generosity, that we would all grow in our generosity. Because generosity is not something that you graduate from. Like you don't ever just reach a pinnacle where you're like, okay, I can't be any more generous than this. No, there's always another level. Generosity is like humility. You don't ever graduate in humility. How many know the day you say, oh, I'm the most humble person in the world? You lost it. <laughs> you keep growing in your humility and in your generosity. And we've been centering this series around this idea that God said, you cannot serve money and God. One of them is going to be your master. God said, nothing is vying for your attention against me like money. And so that's what we've been looking at in this series. And this is the last of the series. And ooh, it's going to be good. I feel it. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 4 today. Genesis chapter 4. And I'm going to look at verses 1 through 10. Genesis chapter 4. Start at verse number 1 and we'll land at verse number 10. If you are struggling to find Genesis, you ain't been to church in a long time. And there's no shade. No shade. It's all good. It's the first book in the Bible, Genesis. And we're going to be in chapter 4. Start at verse number 1 and land at verse number 10. When you are ready to read it, say, yeah. yeah. If you're not ready, you need some time, say, wait a minute. I heard one wait a minute. I'm going to wait for you to find Genesis. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's on the screen, too. It's the cheat code. Genesis 4, it says, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Another version says, man child. I like that. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel, and now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering. Some of the fruits of the soil. Some. Uh, he, he brought some. He brought something to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast, and he felt some type of way, but didn't want to say nothing. So God brings it up and said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? How many know when God is asking you questions, he's not looking for information? He knows everything. Whenever God is asking you something, he's trying to get you to figure out something. He said, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. It means God can hear injustice. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. This is a scary story, a tragic story. It is the first murder in the Bible. It's interesting that the first murder is followed by the first offering in the Bible. I wonder how those two things are connected. I want to talk about some of that today. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. It's going to be a long prayer, but just bear with me. 
God, you're awesome. Speak today. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. (laughs) Money talks. That has been our series. Anybody like me in that whenever I go to a hotel and I check in that hotel and then I go to my room in the hotel, I don't know why, but hunger immediately hits me. Am I the only one? Am I the only one? You ever had just hotel hunger hit you? I'm literally the only one. Y'all gonna leave me out here? Okay. Y'all all all hell freaks. Okay. No, it's cool. Maybe it's just me. As soon as I get in a hotel room, hunger hits me. I don't know what they put in the vents of these hotels. I don't know what it is, but I do know that hotel hunger is different than at-home hunger. It's completely different. It's different than holiday hunger because it'll just come out of nowhere and hit you. It just hits you. I imagine it's like having the munchies. Yeah. I've never had the munchies. (laughs) Never had the munchies, but I I know people from the cannabis community. And... (laughs) They have informed me <laughs> that, that the hunger is just instant and incessant. It just, it just hits you out of nowhere. That's what happens to me. Whenever I get into a hotel room, I get hungry. I don't know what it is about peanut M&Ms. As soon as I get in that hotel room, I see the peanut M&Ms, and I have to have them. Never mind they cost $46 for the bag, but I have to have those peanut M&Ms. And then after I ate the whole bag, then I got to wash it down with that $100 bottle of Fiji water. Just wash it down. And it's crazy what happens in these hotel rooms with these snacks, and particularly those prices. Have you ever looked at the prices of those snacks? Oh, no, you haven't, because they hide the prices. Yeah, yeah, everything else is on display. They put the prices under the couch. It's not till checkout that you're like, what in the, are those caviar Pringles? Why in the world did they cost that much money? They hide the prices. I've always asked myself, why do they charge that much for those in-room snacks? I'll tell you why, because they can they can charge that much. Because you understand, when you are in a hotel room, you are not paying for those snacks. You are paying for the cost of convenience. The cost of convenience is incredibly expensive. And how many of you know, it brings comfort in the moment, but it brings regret later. The cost of sacrifice, ooh, that's expensive too. But at least it has long-term benefits. So I don't know whether you knew this or not. Next time you check into that hotel, those snacks are talking to you. Those snacks in that room are saying something to you. Here's what they're saying. You can buy this now for the offered price, or you can leave the comfort of your room to try to find it cheaper somewhere else. What is your time and your effort worth? Those snacks in your room are making you choose between convenience and sacrifice, convenience and sacrifice. And they have gotten me plenty of times. I'm just gonna tell it like I gotta tell it. I never forget one time before I stayed at hotels that actually had little snacks in the room. I remember hunger hit me in this hotel. I was so hungry and I went to the vending machine. Went to the vending machine, I will never forget this. I needed a Snickers. When hunger comes, you gotta do what you gotta do. And I put the money in the Snickers, in the little machine and I hit the button and the numbers for the Snickers, I will never forget this. That machine said, I said, what in the world is going on? I said, uh-uh. I hit the buttons again. It said, zip, zip, zip. I was so hungry. I said, well, maybe they need some more money. I put more money into the machine, hit the button again. It just went, zip. Then I got mad. I started kicking the machine, hitting it. And I was like, this is ridiculous. So then I just said, okay, give my change back. Give my change back. Couldn't get my money back. So now I'm mad. I'm like, I got to talk to a manager immediately. But as I'm walking away, getting ready to go talk to the manager, I noticed something out of my peripheral. It was a sheet of paper on the ground. It had fallen off the machine. And written on that sheet of paper were three words, three words that would have saved me some frustration. Three words that would have made me not lose my money. Three words that would have stopped me from kicking at that machine. Three words that are actually the title of my message today. (sighs) Out of order. That's what I want to talk to you today. I want to talk to you about what happens when things get out of order. Order. That's my title. I'm going to tape it right there so you can see it. And those of you who have ever heard me preach, you realize that I'm preaching out of order. Because typically when I preach, if you pay attention at all, you will know that I will start with a biblical text. 
and then I will give you my title. Then I'll say a prayer. Then I'll preach the message. Then I call the keys. Then I close. That's typically how I preach. But today I changed the order. Whew, I gave you the text. Then I started preaching the message. Now I'm giving you the title. And how many you know when things get out of order, frustration will always ensue? When things get out of order, oh, you will lose money. You might lose your mind because bad things happen whenever things get out of order. I wonder if the frustration in your life right now is simply because things are out of order. I ain't going to get a whole lot of amens. I just got to amen myself. Preach, Robert. Thank you so much, sir. The rest will join in later. I wonder if the reason you're upset is not because you don't have the right things in your life. You just got them out of order. Could it be possible that your financial stress and your relational stress and your emotional stress right now is simply because things are out of order? Order. That's why we started this year talking about relationships. Relationships, because some of you, your frustration in your relationships is because things are out of order. And it's a free country. You can do what you want. Like, if you want to, you can slide in somebody's DMs and then slide into bed with them and then start talking about marriage. Ooh, do what you want. I'm just saying that's out of order. If I have physical intimacy first, it's something about that physical intimacy that's going to blind me to who you really are. And if I've already given myself to you physically and now I'm actually getting to know you, I'm realizing, whoo, you good in the bedroom, but we don't have any values that line up with each other. And how many know things get jacked up when it's out of order? God is a God of order. When it comes to money and finances, whoo, God actually has a system. He has an order. He has a structure. Your God is a God of order. As a matter of fact, if you read your Bible, you can't even get past the first sentence of the first book without realizing that God is a God of order. Your whole Bible, Genesis, the book of beginnings, starts by letting you know that God is a God of order. Check out the first line of the first book of the greatest book that was ever written, your Bible. It says, in the beginning, God that's a good order right there. In the beginning, God. You realize I could drop the mic and we could all go home right there. Because some of you right now, a whole lot would be fixed in your life if you just said, in the beginning, God. <laughs> Ooh, not in the beginning, my boo. Not in the beginning, my kids. Not in the beginning, my job. But in the beginning, God. Oh, I'm going to preach whether y'all say amen or not. I know this is good. Those words right there will change your life. In the beginning, God. That is in order. That's why he starts off the book saying, in the beginning, God. He doesn't even waste time explaining his existence to you. He doesn't even waste a sentence to prove that he's actually there. He just says, in the beginning, God. I don't have to waste my time explaining it because nobody voted me in. Nobody can vote me out. I am God all by myself. In the beginning, God. I feel like preaching in here today. In the beginning, God. Ooh, if he was in the beginning, that means he was before the beginning. He was before the beginning. That means he started to start. He began the began. <laughs> that before there was a beginning, he was before the before. Oh, what an awesome God that you serve. That even before beginning started, he was already there. When there was a beginning, he was the be before the beginning. He is omnipotent, all power, omniscient, all see, all knowing. He is God, and beside him there is no other. He is preeminent. He is pre existent. He is powerful. He is superlative. He is superior. He has never been second a day in his life. And some of y'all are sitting down like you don't know he's first. But I guess somebody that knows that your God has never lost a battle and never been second. You ought to praise him like you know he's the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. Somebody take a 10 second praise break because he's first. He's first. He is at the beginning. In the beginning, God. He's showing us the order. He's showing us the structure. He's showing us that I have never been second. I can't be second. I am first, and I do things in order. Look at how he does creation. Sky first, then the stars. Water first, then the fish. Land first, then the vegetation. 
Man gets formed first, then he breathes into him the breath of life. He's a God of order. You understand that in all those aforementioned issues, every single one of them, the second thing that was created or the second thing that was done is intrinsically connected to the first thing. The survival of the second thing is connected to the first thing. You got to get things in order. If, if, if he creates the stars first and goes, uh-oh, you need a sky. Hold on, hold on, my bad. Hold on, star. And then does the sky. No, it becomes a meteorite and the star dies. If he creates the plant first and the plant's standing there, he's like, oh, my bad. You need some land. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Don't move. Don't say planet. Hold up. Oh, you can't. Hold on. And then it creates the swamp. It creates a problem. If he creates the fish first and then goes, oh, my bad. You need water. The fish going to be doing a Harlem Shake right there. And, and, and your God is so brilliant that the second thing, survival, is connected to the first thing on earth. That's why we were foreign first. And then the spirit because I have to have a body while I'm on earth, but I will never die. My spirit will always stay. Is this too much for a Sunday morning? My spirit will always be alive, but in this earth, my spirit better stay in this body. If it tries to do its own thing, we have a problem, and God has always been a God of divine structure and order. He creates a garden called Eden, paradise first. Then he puts the man and the woman in the paradise. Paradise was created first, then he placed them in the paradise. And watch this, even in the paradise, they had to work. <sighs> they had to tend the garden. In other words, before sin entered the world, God put work in paradise. Oh, somebody don't like that right there. <laughs> Because work is a cuss word for some of us in here today. Because we don't want to do what the psalmist said, work, 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 work. We'd rather sit, 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 sit. But I'm trying to tell you, God did not create any single one of us to sit. He created us to work. Work was not a result of sin coming in the world. God created work before sin ever came into the world. God created you for a purpose. He did not create you to just sit on your butt and watch Netflix and Hulu, Hulu and play Call of Duty. You actually have a call and a duty that is on your life. Come on, I'm going to talk to some older people. I know you're retired, but don't sit back yet. There's a generation that actually needs your wisdom. There's a generation that actually needs your battle scars of what you've been through. You don't ever get to retire in the kingdom of God. God always has something for you to put your hands to. Work! Ooh, people don't like that, especially this generation. They want to get paid to chill. Oh no, do your research. Employers are struggling right now to get workers working people the pandemic jacked the whole lot of us up because people are like well, oh, you want me to come in <laughs> like leave my house <laughs> companies are falling apart right now profit is down why because people want to sit in their bathrobe and just click a little box on a computer nobody wants to work but look at the principles in creation that even in paradise <gasps> there was work Talk to people that have money. Talk to people that have money. They will tell you the scariest thing in the world is to have a whole lot of money and no purpose. The greatest debauchery you've ever seen is people with too much money and nothing to do. That's why some billionaires, still, Warren Buffett, still working right now because you need work. So in paradise, there was work. Oh, also in paradise, there were parameters. Even in paradise, with all these trees that were in the garden, God puts one tree in the middle and says, that one you can't touch. Even in paradise, God had boundaries and parameters and had some things that were right there in your face, but you couldn't touch it. And if I was there in the garden, I would have said, why come? <laughs> why? To which God probably would have said, wrong question. Sometimes we're discontent because we're asking the wrong questions. Instead of, why I can't touch it, here's a better question. How many of these trees did you plant? I just told you to manage it. How many of them did you create? By the way, who put the breath in your body? Those are better questions. See, some of y'all are frustrated right now because you're asking the wrong questions. How come I don't have a house like that? I wish I had a house like this. I hate this house. Instead of saying, who I could be under a bridge right now sleeping, but thank God I got some type of shelter. Who let me do a Holy Ghost of praise in my little apartment. I ain't got much square footage, so I'm praising in the bathroom and the bedroom, but I'm so glad that at least I got some... 
Wrong questions. Wrong questions. How come? Which tree did you plant? Uh, none of them. Okay. So since none of it's yours, and I gave it to you, you shouldn't have a problem not touching one. So think with me today. Let's go deeper. Before there was offering, before there was tithing, before there was giving, there was always a principle of something in your life that you don't touch. Something that is consecrated. Something that is set apart to God. And every time I don't touch it, I'm saying, God, I trust you. God, your way is better than my way. God, you know what's best for me. I don't know what's best for me. I follow your word. And just like a dumb child who's like, for real? Okay. That's how I want to follow your word. That was all the way in the garden. God had parameters of something that we could not touch. But come on, you know the story. You've seen the movie. That how come came into our lives because the serpent deceived Eve. And she took of the forbidden fruit. Then she gave it to the dummy that was with her, Adam. And he took it. And he ate it. That whole scenario right there is out of order. Come on. The, the lady was never supposed to provide for the man. Really, bro? You ain't supposed to be eating off of her. The order got jacked up. Oh, don't text me later. Don't send no email. I'm all for you. I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-T. Do you know? I'm all for it. Get your money. Be an entrepreneur, sis, an entrepreneur, sister girl. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. But please don't be supporting another man's lifestyle. I realize that you got to go through some seasons, especially if you're married. But my goodness, it better be both of us doing something. It better be both of us coming together. The woman wasn't created to go, here you go. No wonder sin entered the world. <laughs> Everything got out of order. And chaos always ensues when the order gets broken. So sin enters the world and the ramifications were dire. All of a sudden, God curses the serpent first. He then starts outlining some ramifications and consequences of sin. He says, now you're going to have pain in childbirth. He said, now when you work, the ground is going to produce thorns and thistles, and by the sweat of your brow, you will work. Work was not a result of sin, but now by the sweat of your brow, you're going to work. There's going to be toil. Even the ground is cursed because of what you did. Oh, I should say my shout to the end, but can I fast forward to the end of the story when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and all of a sudden, he starts sweating drops of blood, and I think it was Dr. Luke that said the blood that he sweated even hit the ground, so even before he gets to the cross, his blood is redeeming work, and his blood is redeeming the ground that got cursed. I want to thank God for the second man, Adam, and not the first Adam that decided to die with his bride. Thank God for Jesus who said, I'm going to die for my bride. Ah. That's to y'all want cotton candy preaching. Y'all don't want to go deeper. Never mind. God said, these are the ramifications of sin. And even in the pain of the ramifications, he still gave a promise. Read it when you get to the crib. Genesis 3.15 is the first blues clue of the coming Messiah. He looks at Eve and says, I know he got you. This is my version. I know he tricked you. He deceived you. But guess what? There's going to be hostility, enmity between you, between your seed and the seed of the serpent. But don't worry. He is going to bruise your heel, but your seed is going to crush his head. In other words, payback is coming. I know you messed up, but payback is coming. I know you messed up, but I already prepared a lamb to be slain before the foundation of the earth. I don't know who this is for because I didn't say it's first service. Somebody made a mistake and you're dealing with the consequences, but please don't let the enemy make you think that you're done and your life is over with. If you still got a pulse, you still got a purpose and God ain't through with you yet. And you ought to just start looking at the enemy and say, payback is coming. I know I got some stuff out of order, but God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and a hundred chances, and I'm so glad for grace, because I get another chance, and payback ah, is coming. It's coming. So all of that is my intro. And, <laughs> but uh, you got to understand all that. In Genesis 1, 2, and 3, 
Because if you get that order, now you can understand what we're walking into when we get to Genesis chapter 4. Because Genesis chapter 4, check this out, we are reading the story of the very first family. No, 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 like this is the first family. Any parents in here today? All the parents, make some noise. Parents. You feel that lack of energy? <laughs> I'm with you. They say, oh, I'm here. <laughs> you ain't got kids, you don't know the struggle. And, but parents, you remember? Remember that first child? The first child. Not the fourth or the fifth. And if you got six or seven, come on, you can, fellas, you can even miss that one. But like the first, I'm playing. Like, remember the first? The feelings of, oh my goodness, we're about to have a little human that's the perfect amalgamation of you. Remember the first? Y'all, this is the, the first, first family. Like, the fir- like, Adam and Eve were made. They weren't born. Genesis 4 is literally the first family. Look at the joy and the confusion. (laughs) You see Eve getting bigger? Adam's like, man, sin has really jacked the world up. What's going on with your stomach? She said, oh, I know you ain't talking to me. You don't got the same six pack you had before the father. You know, can you see like, don't even know what's happening. They were like, oh, wait a minute. This is what happens. My stomach gets bigger. Oh, imagine the first day seeing that baby boy. She names him Cain, which means I have acquired. Look at what she says, with the help of the Lord. She still knows how much she jacked up in the garden. With the help, this wasn't me. It wasn't even really all you, Adam. With the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man, child. This is the beauty of Cain being born. Cain, in Eve's mind, is going to be her deliverer. This is what every woman hoped is that they would actually bring deliverance to the deliverer. But hear me, when Eve hears the promise that her seed is going to crush the head of the serpent, she had been thinking, Cain is it. Not realizing God was stalking thousands of years into the future to a little virgin girl in Bethlehem. (sighs) That's that's why it says the seed of the woman. Because women don't have seed. But the way a woman can have seed is if a Holy Spirit overshadows a woman. And there is no natural earthly father, but there's a heavenly father. This is too much. And there's a heavenly father. She's thinking, this is my promised child. And so Cain, watch this, now has the pressure huh, of being not just the firstborn, the first the firstborn. Oh, and now on his shoulders is the weight of saving the world. Can you see him all over his nursery? You gonna crush the head of the servant. Mom, what is this? Just get to the promise I got. Now be quiet and read it. Can you see how excited she was to have Cain? Imagine what it was like to be Cain. Let me just pause right here and tell you that our birth order does play a part in our personalities. Oh, much has been written about this. Dr. Kevin Lehman has an incredible book called The Birth Order Book, where he talks about how our birth order actually does play a part in our personalities. Oh, come on. Where are all the middle children at? All the middle children make some noise. Ooh, I love y'all middle children. Let me tell you something. You want to hang around with the middle child. Middle children are incredible, okay? Middle children are loyal. If you want a friend, get you a middle child. They so used to trying to get attention from either side. I'm saying you just give a middle child some attention. They are with you. They are ride or die. Middle children make great spouses. Get you a middle child. As long as you're going to give them some attention, they are with you. Middle children, all the middle children. We're all the last born, all the babies, all the babies. You see how loud they are? <laughs> That's their personality. I'm the last one. Oh, I ain't never met a stranger. Put them in the elevator by themselves. They'd be like, I love these buttons. I don't know which one. <laughs> I want to push. Forget responsibility, but man, I'm telling you, they have personality. <laughs> Ooh, but my favorite, where the firstborns at? Where the first... You might not have fun. You want to get something done? Holler at your firstborns. You want some responsibility? Holler at your firstborns. We were the experiment. 
we were the guinea pigs. Y'all got in trouble. You got sent to your room. We got in trouble. We got sent to our room, but not before a speech. You should know better. You the oldest. That's why most presidents, firstborns. Most comedians, lastborns. Put yourself in the psychological shoes of Cain. Firstborn. First, firstborn. Used to the attention. Used to being first. And if we're honest, I think all of us, irrespective of your birth order, innately we all want to be first, don't we? I mean, who's trying to be second? I want to be first. I want the attention. So some of you scrolling on your gram right now, trying to get the likes, trying to get the attention. Nobody wants to be second. We all want to be first. The problem with you putting yourself first is that is it's out of order. God said first is reserved for only one person, and that's me. So imagine what's happening in the household of Adam and Eve with Cain, who's used to being first. He's the favorite. He used to be in preferred until one day Eve says, uh-oh, you got a brother coming. And Cain's like, a what? <laughs> a baby brother, aren't you excited? Uh, no. Can you imagine when Eve gives birth to Abel? And now for the first time in the history of the world, eyes go off of Cain. And now they look at cute baby Abel. It took me back to when we had our firstborn, Evie, and she already told me she saw first service. I owe her $5 every time I use her, so your $5 is coming. <laughs> I never forget, my firstborn, Evie, was born, and then we had my man-child, Robert Madu the third, my man-child, my namesake. I never forget, because Evie felt some type of way even the whole pregnancy, but I never forget the day we came back from the hospital. We're sitting in the living room, and I'm holding my son, I mean skin on skin, this is a moment, my man child. And Evie, she looks up at me holding my son, Robert III, and she goes, mm, dada, she was still so little, mm, dada, mwah, mwah, mwah. I said, oh, you want to kiss your baby brother? She said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm not making this up. I lean my son down for her to give him a kiss. She switches takes out her hand and scratches him all on his little newborn face. I said, ah! Ah! I didn't know what to do. It was a natural reaction. One heart, but I just went, pop. I just gave a little pop. Just a little, don't call CPS. I just, pop. I said, Evie. And then she went, ah! And then I started crying. I said, what are you doing? Why would you do that? Isn't it crazy? Nobody taught her how to do that. Have you ever noticed nobody teaches you how to sin? You don't look at a two or three year old and say, you're about to get in trouble, you should make something up. <laughs> like I know chocolate's all in your nose and on your teeth, but tell them you didn't eat it. <laughs> nobody teaches you that. It's already in you. So when we read Genesis 4, ladies and gentlemen, this is the genesis of jealousy. This is the embryo of envy. This is where comparison was conceived. Oh yes, Cain will ultimately kill Abel, but I think the jealousy started in his heart long before the murder happened. And that's how sin always does. Notice later, when God judges Cain's offering, notice what he says, the language is scary. He said, sin is at your door, not sitting because I could handle sitting. It's crouching. He uses predatory language. That right when you think sin is chilling, it's not. It's waiting to jack you up. You will do sin and think you can handle it, but then sin will do you. This is why it is so dangerous. He says sin is crouching at your door, waiting for you. And long before... It ever turned into murder. It was already in seed form in Cain's heart. Look at what happens. They come before the Lord one day and they bring their offerings to the Lord. 
they both come to the presence of the Lord and bring the offering. When you look at Cain and Abel, we're not looking at the story of an atheist and a believer. No, they both believed in God. Both of them, they can see him. They both went to church. Obviously, this is some type of service. And they're coming to God, not empty-handed. They both give in the offering. This ain't two different people. This ain't a believer and an unbeliever. This is two church-going, God-believing, offering-giving people. I mean, sign me up to have that person in our church. You come to church, you believe in God, and you go to offering. It wasn't like Cain was empty-handed. He had something to give. Why would God not look at favor when you actually come with an offering? Oh, it must be deeper than an offering. It must not just be about the offering. God must have some uncanny ability to look at your heart and the posture of your heart. This is why I actually want to pause right now and talk to somebody who perhaps has been under bad teaching and you think you're under a curse if you don't tithe. I don't believe that. Let me just take that theological position right there. I don't believe that once I put my faith in Jesus and he died on the cross, shed his blood for me, that I'm under any type of curse. I believe all curses are broken in Jesus' name off of my life. And so if you're in here and some pastor guilted you into tithing because you're like, oh, I'm afraid. I don't want to be under a curse. Da, da, da. That is a horrible heart posture to give. My heart posture to give doesn't come out of fear for me being under the curse. It comes out of an awareness that God has been so good to me and I don't own anything. I'm just the steward of what he's given me and it is my joy to actually give. God looks deeper. They both brought an offering. You would think since they're both bringing an offering, it's good. No, God looks deeper. It reminds me of Luke's gospel where there's a story where Jesus is watching the offering. Can you imagine? Being in the service and Jesus about offering plate. <laughs> oh, you know you would change. You'd be like, oh, let me go and get this little hundred. Oh, was that Jesus? A thousand dollars? 25 cents? <laughs> Jesus is watching the offering and, and people are putting big checks in, big checks in, throwing in the offering. And this little widow didn't have much. She gives her two little mites and puts it in walks away, maybe even embarrassed, thinking, what is going to happen with that? And Jesus looks, not even at her, which, by the way, you don't know what your seed does. He talks behind her back and goes to his disciples and said, guess who put the most in? That widow. They're like, the one with the messed up hair? Yep, she gave the most. Because the rest of them gave out of their wealth. She gave all she had. The rest gave out of convenience. Her heart posture was different. She gave out of sacrifice. You saw the amount. I saw the heart. I look deeper. Cain brings an offering. Abel brings an offering. Cain just brings some, 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 some. He worked the field. He brought some. Here's some. Abel brought the fat portions of the firstborn of his flock. Abel's offering required a sacrifice. An animal had to die. Cain just brought something. The fact that God did not look with favor upon Cain's offering lets me know that there had to be some type of conversation, although we don't see it in the text. There had to be some conversation or some way where they knew there's a protocol, there's an order in how you give to God. If he did not let them know there was a way to give and he looks without favor on Cain's offering, then he's not a good God. But the fact that he didn't look at favor with his offering means that there must have been an order, a way to give. But the mentality of Cain is, you should be glad I'm getting something. I give what I want. You ever met those people? I have. It's funny. I've been planting, I've been, I ain't been pastoring long, but it's funny when people get mad at the little comments they drop on you. Oh, uh, excuse me, pastor. You ever notice it's pastor when they mad? Excuse me, pastor. Uh, I tithe. I'm a tithe. member. people have said that since we planted this church. When they get mad about something, I'm a tithe member of the church. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? It's revealing the heart of Cain. I tithe, you owe me something. I serve. You owe me some. I was here setting up chairs. You owe me. Do I, Cain? <laughs> K 
Cain's heart is always revealed when things don't go the way you want them to go. You can't tell Cain's heart when everything is good. But when people get preferred before Cain, Cain has such a heart of comparison. Whenever things don't work out the way Cain wants it to work out, you always know that you got a heart of Cain. Whenever you look at God and go, you owe me. You gonna let my mom get sick? And I've been praying for people at the altar. It's a heart of Cain. You gonna let me lose my job? And I gave in the offering last year. It's a heart of Cain. Abel is just grateful that you have something to give. And look at the compassion of God. And I hope you hear the heart of the Father today, not condemning you, but look at the love that he has towards Cain's. That even after he looked on favor with Abel's offering, but didn't look at favor with Cain's, look at the compassion of the Father. He says, hey, after he's in his feelings, he won't even say anything. He notices his facial expression. God is that kind. He notices your facial expression. He says, why are you angry? Why, are you, why is your face downcast? Do you know your God is that good that he knows how you really feel? He can feel your frustration. You might have fooled everybody else because you're posting. You know you ain't living like you're posting. And you're smiling at the party, but you're depressed on the inside. God knows the real you, and he's concerned with the real you. And he doesn't even come in condemnation. He comes with kind questions. This is how I know God is so gracious. He comes with questions even after they mess up. He did it to his parents, too. Remember, after they took of the forbidden fruit, he did not come how I would have come with my kids jacked up. Did I tell you not to eat that tree? Did I say don't touch it? Did I not say don't touch it? That's how I would have came at him. Not God. He goes, where are you? Did you eat of the tree that I told you not to? Who told you you were naked? Questions, counseling, compassionately trying to get you to ask yourself what he's asking you. How did I end up here? Cain, why are you downcast? If you do what is right, well, I'm not accepted to. In other words, I'm not a respecter of persons. I'm a respecter of principles. And don't be jealous of Abel. You can get the favor that Abel has if you do what Abel did. How many are thankful that God doesn't respect persons or people, but he does respect his principles, and he just wants you to get it in? Order. And God says, the order that I want specifically in finances, but all across the board is me first. Me first. So that's the power of the tithe. And not just the tithe. People get hung up on that. But it's when it comes first. Not after you paid your mortgage and TXU and then you're like, I right, got here. No, it's first because you are first in my life. I don't want to steal from preachers. I hate when preachers steal from other preachers. But I was listening to this preacher the other day. And he did this powerful illustration. This powerful illustration about first. And it was, a, it was a little short clip I was watching. The preacher was actually preaching at Gillies. It was a crazy coincidence. And um, I want to I wanna show that clip of that preacher real quick. Because he just had, no, I don't want to steal from this, this preacher. It, just, it was a great clip he had showing the power of first. I want to show you this preacher real quick. Just watch, watch this. Proverbs chapter 3 says, honor the Lord with your riches and bring him the first fruit. Please don't miss this. It's not a tithe if it's not first. Leviticus chapter 27 verses 30 and 32 says, this is God talking. He says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. It, it's not a tithe if it's not first. Ten pieces of cheese, the first is his. That's God. I have the other nine. But you know how a lot of people give? This is your cheese. This is your paycheck. Here's how a lot of people, when they get their paycheck, what's the first thing you cut? That mortgage, that rent. The rent is real. So the first chunk goes. Got to pay my rent. I'm not trying to be out on the street. Pay. My mortgage, pay my rent. What you do next with it? Oh, car. 
Got to pay that card. No, see, you should have got a kid, but now you're trying to ball out. So. <laughs> There's my car payment. So you give the car. And then what else you, what else you got? Which, oh, our generation, especially millennials, have more credit card debt, school loan debt than any other generation. So let me go pay that debt down. Oh, Got to pay the debt, credit card debt, and that interest. <laughs> Let's see what else. Oh, got to eat out. Got to eat out. <laughs> Come on. DoorDash, hallelujah. <laughs> got to eat. What else? Netflix, Hulu, got to watch something. You, Squid Games, all of it. Ain't trying to be here in, in the dark. Let's <laughs> pay all that. What else? What else? Uh, huh? Lights, pay for the lights. Yeah. TXU, hallelujah. <laughs> pay for my lights. What else? What? Oh, internet, phone bill. Come on. I got a following. I'm an influencer. <laughs> this is work. Scrolling is work. What else? What else? Um, uh, oh, your boo, your boo. Come on, spouse. Or the one you're trying to get. Hallelujah. Get them something to. And once we paid all that, somebody said lights, somebody shouted out other stuff. And then once we've done all that, <laughs> then we come to church. And like, well, pastor been preaching on being generous. And I am generous. So let me get a little bit of this. Don't you love the people that still put change in? <laughs> what? What? It's still money? What? <laughs> all right. All right. Here. What's in it for us? Here. Her. You laughing, but it's happening. And you wonder why you don't ever have enough. It's not a tithe unless he's first. I know it doesn't make sense, not, but you can't see it. You got to taste first. Here's what God wants from you. God says, if you would just flip it, If you would just stop waiting to see if you can afford it, you'll never afford it until you step out and do it. Say, God, all right. He says, put me to the test. Look, he says, I wish you would. Okay, God. Ooh, it hurts. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to give you. Have you ever given sacrificially? Yeah. <laughs> you ever put something in there and been like, watch the go down? <laughs> and here's what's crazy, just like I just told you. How many know if you trust them with the cube, trust them with the square, God says, okay, he's getting it. Let me, if you did it with the cubes, let me see if I can do it with the cheeses. And he'll give you 10, and all he asks, that you give me one. God said, oh, you're going to trust me with Jesus? All right. Can you trust me with Cheetos? I'm bringing different things because I want to be clear. How many of you know the harvest is not always money? This is what preachers jack it up. It is not always money. You don't know how God is going to return it back to you. He just gave you a promise that I'm going to rebuke the devourer and I'm going to make sure I restore the blessing. The issue is not just getting the money. There are some things money cannot buy. You cannot buy peace. You cannot buy joy. They don't sell that at Neiman Marcus. There are some things that money cannot buy. It's not always money. God said, you're going to trust me with the cheese cubes? You're going to trust me with the cheeses? Can I trust you with Cheetos? And they'll give you 10. And all he asks, 10%. And God goes, all right. I can trust them with the Cheetos. But, this is for all the ghetto people. Can I trust you with the flame of hot Cheetos? I'm going somewhere. Because how many you know? 
when you start getting blessed and God starts taking you to new levels, sometimes the people forget the blessing that got them into the place and they start getting more stingy the more God starts blessing. But just because you're flaming hot now, don't stop. It's an opportunity for you to be more generous. Oh, I'm t- it's, like, it's like the guy that started the business and just stepped out on faith was making $50,000 a year. He didn't even think he would make that much and just faithful with the tithe. God starts blessing his business, blessing his business. All of a sudden, that business starts bringing in $3.2 million a year. $3.2 million. And he calls his pastor like, Pastor, I got to talk to you. Pastor like, what's up? He's like, man, you know, you, you talk about the tithe and all that. And I stepped out. I trusted God. He's like, but yo, it was one thing when it was like 50000 He's like, it's $3.2 million now. He's like, yo, 10% of 3.2 is a whole lot. He's like, Pastor, I'm just, I'm being dead serious. Just pray for me. I'm really struggling on the 10% on the 3.2. So the pastor, crazy, old school pastor, he said, oh, I'm going to pray for you. Pastor, everybody here. He said, God, I pray that you take them right back to 50,000. I said, God, take away the 3.2. If he can't trust you with the 3.2, take them back to 50,000. He's like, no, nah, don't pray no more. I'm good. I'm Don't stop when your income gets hot. Don't stop. It's the beauty of tithe. It's that the 10 is the same for everybody. It's a sacrifice for everybody. God made it equal. He said, you're going to trust me with the flame and hot? You're going to trust me with the Cheetos, Cheetos and the cheeses? He said, you know what? I'm about to bless you with some cheesecake. Because I can trust you. It's a test. Somebody say it's a test. Cheesecake. And all God has is four. (laughs) Ten. Let me set it up nice. Look (laughs) at all that's yours. And look at all that God has. Do whatever you want with this. God said, trust me with this. Because when you give me this and not just give it and not just bring it, because it's none of it's yours. When you bring it, it puts a blessing on all of this. God wants to know, do you trust him? <laughs> this was crazy about that preacher. I just, did you enjoy that? It blessed me. Um, <laughs> When I did that illustration, I thought cheesecake was the biggest. But in between service, I realized that God can always do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. So can I keep the sermon going? If you trust him with cheesecake, then he said, oh, I can trust you with the cheesecake. Then I can trust you with the biggest cheese pizza. Oh, see, that, y'all going to give the golf clap to that, but I'm telling you, God just wants to know, if I give it to you, can you trust me enough to say, God, I'm a good steward. I'm a conduit to which you can flow through, and not just money, love, encouragement, my talent, my gift, everything I have is a, from the goodness of God. And all he asks is, can you? Horrible illustration when lunch is around the corner. God, that's yours. I can do what I want with this, but I, I put you first, not out of fear, not out of religion. That's what the Pharisees did. They were great tithers. No, this is out of a heart of abundance and gratefulness. Just saying, God, I'm glad I got anything to give. Hear me. This is something that I have lived. This is not a theory. That clip is from the first year of our church. Every major move in my life, God always gives a whisper in my spirit saying, trust me, I know it's scary. Some people have been day one with this church. They'll testify. I can give you personal testimonies. I can give you testimonies about our church, hear me, that operates on 90% and 10% of the tithe and the offering we give away to ministries, and we've given away hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I remember the steps 
Well, I was like, God, are you sure? Some people in here will know the story. First year of our church, Mother's Day. Before Mother's Day, God spoke to me so clearly. He said, I want you to give $1,000 to every single mom. If it's a single mom in the service of Mother's Day, single mom holding it down, give them 1000 I said, everyone? He said, everyone. I said, can I see how many of them it is first? I'm telling the truth, Pastor. We had $50,000 in our account. We just started. I said, Lord, if 53 mamas show up, we are in the red. And that whisper, trust me, trust me. Never forget that Mother's Day. 20 single moms. I said, oh, thank God, thank God. <laughs> 20 of them came up. I said, any more, any more? None? Okay, great. Y'all 20. <laughs> it's on tape. High five. We were there. Now the Echo Lounge. Give each one of them 1000 that same year, we had a one-day offering, gave away 40000 40000 While we gave it away, Pastor Mike Todd, Transformation Church, sent us a check for 100000 while we had already... I'm telling you, he, he says, test me, and I could be here all day telling you stories. God just wants to know, will you put me first? Last scripture, Exodus 13, the principle of the first. Look at what he says. He says, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male, the first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In the days to come, this is the part I like, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The spirit of Cain forgets the goodness of God. But the spirit of Abel knows if not for the goodness of God, I wouldn't have the house I have. I wouldn't have the job I have. I'm not that holy. I'm not that smart. Everything is his. I'm just glad that I got something to give. And then look what he says. He said, your sons are going to ask. And you can tell the next generation that this was a testimony of God's goodness. You know what I love about this season of our church? We are in the building season, and years from now, we will look back on these moments, and there will be generations that will say, thank you so much for gathering every day at Gillies. Oh, I don't even know what Gillies was. And they'll be stepping in a brand new sanctuary that we'll have one day, and it'll be us saying, yeah, we were the ones that were faithful. We showed up, yeah, you got these plush seats now, but believe me, we used to set up them chairs at Gillies, and it smelled like weed in the back when we walked in there was a concert the night before. You better appreciate this blessing because we paid a price for this blessing and it wasn't even us. It was the, oh, it was the goodness and the faithfulness of a gracious God. He's given so much to me. How could I not? Not just talking about money. I'm talking about everything. Why could you not give him everything? Your talents. Can I keep it 100 with you? I didn't feel like preaching today. I hadn't had a Sunday off this year. I even phoned a friend and they were like, I can't. I'm like, okay, I got to preach. <laughs> but I didn't give myself this gift. So I had to give what I can. I'm telling you, people are waiting on the other side of your generosity. I came across this and I'm so glad my parents found it. I found a sheet of paper that I think could have been preserved for this moment. It's a budget from my parents, my mom and dad. Mom and dad, stand up. Can I just take a moment and honor my parents, Robert and Evelyn Madu Sr. I stand on the shoulders of their faithfulness. It's their faith and their commitment to put me in church and to put in me as a kid. We give to the house of the Lord and we go to the house of the Lord whether you feel like it or not. Thank you, mom and dad. But look at this budget, y'all. I was born June 15, 1984. First born. And look at this budget, September 29th, 1984. Look at what's at the top of that list. Tithe, 
$37. House payment, $170. I didn't come for money. Little bitty apartment. Nursery, $45. Robert Jr., that's me. Food and diapers, $25. Food, $25, gas, $20. Evie, before I had an Evie, my mom, who is Evelyn, she's called Evie. That's her pocket money, $10. I don't know what you got with $10, mama, but I'm glad that was your pocket money. Bob, that's what they call my dad, his pocket money. And because he's Nigerian, savings, $20. And I'm standing in the harvest of their faithfulness. Matter of fact, you're standing <laughs> in the harvest of their faithfulness. You're going to have to sacrifice anyway. Look at Cain, who wasn't willing to bring an animal and kill an animal, ends up killing his own brother. The man who couldn't bring a sacrifice to the Lord ends up shedding the first drop of blood from a human in the Bible because he didn't want to get things in order. This is a plea, not just in your finances, but in your life to say, God, I got to put you first. That is the only seat that he will take. He refuses to be an addition to your life. He will not be your side piece. He must be first. I'm going to ask you stand to your feet. Nobody leaving. I'm going to ask every head be bowed, eyes closed. Could you just stand to your feet very reverently? We're, we're done. We're going to dismiss just in a moment. Would you bow your heads with me? This whole series, I've been trying to at least get you to ask yourself the critical question, am I honoring God with all that he's given me? And if you're not, God says to you what he said to Cain before the murder happened. If you do what is right, will I not look at you with favor? In other words, you still got an opportunity. As long as there is breath in your body, there is an opportunity to get things in order. For some of you, it's going to start with your finances saying, God, I'm going to trust you. For somebody else, maybe it is with your time and you need to start serving more. All your time goes to your job, not to your family, not to your church. You're out there trying to hustle and get more and get more. Some of you, it's the gift God has given you. Some of you have gifts on the inside of you. I talked about it last week, hidden potential that could be used for the glory and for the kingdom of God. And the enemy, whether it's finances, time, or talent, will always tell you, oh, you can't do that. But I'm praying today out of an awareness of how good God has been to us, we'll live with an open hand and operate in generosity. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed today. If you're here today and you say, hey, Pastor Robert, I... I hear God speaking to me and there's an area in my life where I need to get things in order. I don't know what that thing is. I do know that as I'm preaching in generalities, the Holy Spirit has a way of speaking with specificity and saying that's out of order. That's out of order. And just as a sign to the Lord, maybe you're watching Social Global, would you just as a sign to God to say, Lord, I know what that thing is and today's the day. I'm going to put things in their proper place. I'm going to put things in order. I'm going to put you first. Everything in my life should bring honor to you. If that's you and you know what that is, would you just lift up your hand, not for me, but just to the Lord. I believe this is a holy moment to say, God, I'm going to get things in order. Thank you, Jesus. You can lift it up, put it right back down. I want to be very specific. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, man, this would be an incredible moment to do that. One thing we learn from this text is that blood speaks. He said, I hear your brother's blood crying out to me. If blood speaks, I wonder what the blood of Jesus says. It says you're forgiven. It says you can be whole. 
He says, he loves you so much. He says, you are not defined by your past, but you have a hope and a future. And in this quiet moment, God wants you to respond to that blood that was shed for you. He loves you so much. You don't got to fix yourself to get yourself together. You come to him just as you are.